Hi there, my name is Adam Waters, and I'm the lead pastor here at Grace Bible Church in Elmhurst, Illinois. I'm just so glad that you made the decision to take us along with you this week on life's journey. Here at Grace Bible Church, we are a family of faith who seeks forgiveness, healing, and hope in Jesus Christ. Now, we might all come from different backgrounds, but each of us recognize that the tremendous needs in our lives point us to one place, to God, for His answers, His provision, and mostly, for His grace. I hope the following program gives you a new perspective on who God is, who you are, and how you too might find forgiveness, healing, and hope in our Lord Jesus. Thanks for listening. I read Mark 14, 32 through 42. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that, if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, He said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. Many of you know my background, and one of the consequences, I think, of having spent time in prison is that I I look at people who are in prison or who have been in prison much differently, I think, than uh, many of you guys might. I mean, because I remember how I did before I went. I would watch TV. I'd say, oh, lock them up forever. Lock them up. You know, that's where they belong. I'd have a very sort of hard line on the justice side of what it means to be in jail. They're getting what they deserve. And I was certainly getting what I deserved when I was there. But I can tell you from my own experience that there were many times I interacted with people who were innocent, who told me honestly what happened, who I, who I believed and who I trusted, who had no reason at all to lie to me, who often in the sort of context of a confession would talk and they would say, you know, I'm, I'm really, I didn't do it. And that gives me tremendous pause. I believe in our justice system. I believe that we need to work hard to make sure that those who are convicted are convicted properly. What goes along with that is sort of my own personal attitude towards the death penalty. It is a tremendous, grave thing that I think about. I think about it. What what if they're wrong? What if we're wrong? I hear stories of people who go to death row and right before they're put to death, they make a comment sort of stops my heart for a moment and makes me wonder, are they really guilty? Are they really guilty? I think about Jesus like that. Here's a man on death row. He really is. He comes to earth with a sentence of death. He's totally innocent. He's done nothing. And yet everywhere he walks, it's almost as if you can hear dead man walking, dead man walking. The burden that he carries, and we see this in Gethsemane, this sort of weight that he feels of knowing his execution is imminent and how he can come to the place where he says, Lord, whatever you want, not what I want. It's tremendous. And we have lessons from that 
today. I mean, really, what do we do when the, it's, we call it the cup? You know, Jesus prays, may this cup pass from me. What do we do when we're in situations when our cup cannot pass? That it is God's will that we should suffer and that we should partake of the suffering that often happens here on earth as a result of sin. Not just our own personal moral sin, but the catastrophe that happens here on earth as a result of sin. I mean, we've all had situations, I think, varying degrees. Sometimes they're dire, sometimes they're not that bad, especially when we look back on them in perspective. But we really hope that things would end up differently that the situation we find ourselves in would not come to its logical conclusion, that it wouldn't happen to us. We've been in situations where the cup did not pass, and we were forced to deal with the suffering that was part of God's will for us. We were forced to drink it. And sadly, I'm here to reassure all of us that we will have to drink it again one day. There will be a time in our lives where we're going to have to accept the Father's will, regardless of whether or not it's palatable to us whether or not that cup is bitter. You know, how do you get to a place where you're prepared to accept the Lord's will for your life, even though it promises to be the most difficult situation you may ever find yourself in? And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about accepting and embracing our suffering and how to find peace amid that. You know, being um, prior military, one of the things that I love to do is find acronyms and everything. So today we're going to use an acronym. That acronym is PEACE. It's like the Lord just plopped it right there on my desk when I was studying. How to find peace amid your suffering when your cup shall not pass. You know, we need to really understand and grasp this. We need to wrestle with this idea because a couple of things. First is, if we don't, we're going to try to check out and find another way. We're going to miss the blessing that is on the other side of our suffering. Otherwise, uh, also, we need to avoid the consequences that come with our sinful escapism. You know, everything else we do to try to not feel the suffering, that comes with complication. How do we avoid those complications? So if you'll turn with me, if you're not already open, to Mark 14. If you don't have your Bible, that's fine. It'll be up here on the screen. But I encourage you to follow along. So the first thing, when you're dealing with a situation that seems inevitable, like I said, a cup that cannot pass, and you're struggling to accept it, we need to do what Jesus did. The first thing he did was pray to the Father. That's our P. Pray to the Father. Verse 32. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. That was their point. That was the reason that they went to the Mount of Olives. Jesus knew the power and importance of prayer. We see it again and again throughout his life. It was when he was being tempted. In the desert, he prayed. It was when he was preparing to make a difficult decision or when he was preparing to go to the cross. He knew how important prayer was. And he models it for us here. There's three hallmarks here of this prayer of Jesus that I want us to look at. First is he prays persistently. As we read the text, we see that Jesus prayed three times, really, that the cup would pass. We see in the New Testament, Paul praying to the Father that the thorn in his flesh would be removed three times. We see the the widow who comes before the judge and begs again and again that something would happen. Pray persistently. He kept at it. There's um, sort of a, a, I don't know, almost like the, the father of prayer, maybe, I don't know, from the 19th century, a man named George Mueller, who fed the people of Great Britain. Uh, he cared for those who were suffering during tremendous times of poverty uh, during the 19th century. And really, his life is just consistent evidence of answered prayer. He would spend most of his mornings in prayer from the moment he woke up almost entirely until breakfast, almost never being distracted. And one of the things as I was reading about him this week that really it convicted me is he said that often he would start praying in the morning and the first 15 minutes, his mind would just be wandering. First 30 minutes, mind would just be wandering. And it wasn't until that like 30th minute when he realized prayer was actually happening. How many of us give up in that first 15 minutes? We try hard, we pray, we're distracted, and we say, well, that's as good as it gets. I guess I've done what I need to do for the morning. Or I feel that I've sort of begged God enough to get me out of this situation. I've done my due diligence as a Christian. But no, George laid into his prayer. He, le- he prayed even when he didn't feel like praying. And what we come to find out in George's life is that Basically, everything he was able to give to the poor, to the needy in Great Britain, the result of prayer. 
They'd have no food to feed orphans. He'd wake up in the morning, Lord, we have no food. Five minutes later, a knock on the door, people delivering bread. He kept a prayer journal, 30,000 prayer requests. So when you go back and look, he would pray and then show an answer. 500 answered prayers in a year, that's one a day. How many prayers do you want answered? He prayed persistently because he knew the power. Sometimes in our life, we plan our life and then we ask God through prayer to sort of bless it instead of spending all of our time in prayer, asking God what it is we're supposed to do and spending the least amount of time actually doing it because it's finally been empowered. It's finally according to God's will. Not only persistently, but Jesus prayed honestly. As we see here in the garden, Lord, take it from me. I don't want this. To understand this, this is, a, this is something mysterious. This is God himself in the flesh. Come to die according to the Father's will. Come to redeem sinners. He knew it from, the begin- from eternity past. He knew that this day would come. He also knew there was no other way. Because fa- if there was any other way, the Father would have done it. <laughs> Yet he sits in the garden alone at night, begging the Father that something else would happen. How honest are your prayers? Yesterday I was talking to somebody and they were talking about Ukraine and they said, I just don't know what to pray anymore. I just find myself just begging God. Even accusing God, yelling at God, demanding from God. I, my prayer life's all messed up. I said, it sounds like a psalm to me. We need to be honest when we come before the Father and tell him exactly what our heart is asking. We're exactly what we want, not what we think the Father wants to hear. And finally, Jesus prayed trustingly. In the end, he accepted the Lord's will. He says, not my will, but yours. We're going to learn what it takes uh, to do that. Never easy. Never easy. Yet he trusted that the Lord's will was what in the end would be best despite what the circumstances might have looked like in the moment. And when we pray, because there's prayer is powerful, important, we need to understand that certain things happen. First, when we pray, the situation is changed, really, right? Otherwise, what's the point of prayer? We ask for something to have. George Mueller asked, I don't have any bread. Let's pray about it. Bread shows up. The situation is changed. You know, but I've learned more often than not, the prayer is changed. The person praying is the one who actually changes. Um, when I was uh, in jail, I had the opportunity, according to the law, technically, to get out on work release. By that time, I had been a believer for four years. I was, I was I, me and the Lord. Lord and I, we were close. The, probably the most close, the closest I've been with God ever, even now, was those times, or those times where I would sit on my rack and open the Word and just be with Him. Sometimes I actually long for those days where I had no responsibility except to spend time with God. And that's all I did. And so I prayed to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm coming up on a time you know that I can get work release. I can get out, begin integrating myself back into the community. And Lord, I know you can do this. I know you're powerful. I know you want to do this. I did everything that I could. I worked in my own power. I wrote letters to congressmen and to senators and told them my story and asked them to help me get out on work release. Nobody. Nobody. Some responded nicely with their stock sort of political letter like they always do. But, I mean, most of the time, uh, I got nothing. And I wrestled with it. Lord, I've done everything. I've done everything for you. I pray to you every day. I read my Bible every day. Let me rephrase it. I deserve this. And God said no. He said you're going to stay for this extra two years. And I think looking back on it, that it was that time in those prayers, wrestling with God, I come to realize when I got told no, that those two years were the most important times of my time in there. That's where the most growth happened. And so in my prayer, I was changed. By the time I got out, pretty quickly, I'd already come to, you know, come to accept pretty quickly after I was told no that I wasn't going anywhere. And I was sort of able to just embrace it and move on and help people and continue to minister while I was there. But I realized the situation didn't change. I did. And that's really important for us to realize. You know, prayer is perhaps the primary action or discipline of the Christian life over service, over corporate worship, Bible reading. We gather here on Sunday mornings. But you know, Christianity happens in your prayer closet. 
Christianity happens on your knees. Christianity happens on your drive to work. This is what we are called to be, our communers with the Most High God. Those are prayers. People who pray. When you look at a Christian, you see someone who speaks to God and someone who listens. When your cup cannot pass, call out to the Father. Ask Him to change the situation, but ultimately ask Him to change your heart. Lord, make me not want what it is that I want if it's not your will. If it's not your will. Ask that He would prepare you for the time of testing that might come. To give you joy in your suffering. Can you imagine that? Suffering? I mean, really suffering and still having joy Admit it. Only God can give you that. And we ask that through prayer. Or we ask the Lord to change us so that we can maintain a godly, Christ-centered, eternal perspective. Some of us have gone through very difficult situations, painful things we'd never want to go through again. But in the light of eternity, when we realize that what happens here on earth in this life has repercussions for the next, and that next life is eternal, for, that means forever. For, that means never ending. This life becomes less and less, the suffering that we feel here becomes less and less painful, I think. Because we can look at the end and say, well, you know what? This is hard now, but one day I will be with Christ. One day I will be healed. One day I won't have to worry about this situation I'm in. The relationships around me will be restored. I won't have to suffer. And for the moment, this life, while it seems long, you know, we never look, we never talk to old timers, people on their deathbed, and they say, oh, it's been a long, long life. I'm finally glad I'm here. Most of the time, people say, it went so fast. It went so fast. And, and by an eternal perspective, we can understand that better. Prayer is foundational to finding peace when our cup cannot pass, but it's not the only thing we should do. We should also, this is E, enlist the fellowship of trusted friends. Enlist the fellowship of trusted friends. Verse 33, he took Peter, James, and John along with him and began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Now, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said. Stay here and keep watch. Jesus brought people along with him on his, father's, on his journey to the Father's will. Notice how his demeanor changes. He's with the disciples, and as he gets less and less people around him, as he gets more and more quiet with just his most trusted associates, he, he finds solitude with his inner circle, and he comes clean. My soul is troubled. Even Jesus, here on earth, while not perfect, in the, the people he put around him were not perfect, he still had trusted associates, brothers, fellow warriors, those who would walk with him, in his time in need. We'll see they're not perfect, and we see they fail. And you know what? Those people who put you around you, they're going to fail too, but we're going to talk about that. We cannot live this life alone. Now, while we're called to suffer individually, we are commanded to suffer with each other. Do you hear that? We are commanded to suffer with each other. Galatians 6.2 says, carry each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That means we are acting like Jesus. We are fulfilling what we were made for when we suffer with each other when we feel the pain. Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Elsewhere in the Bible, it says we're all one body. That when one of us suffers, everyone suffers. So we're called to do that with one another. Nevertheless, this text shows us that we struggle to fulfill this high calling, don't we? Many of us have placed people around us and asked to walk with us, asked them to walk with us. We've suffered, we've struggled, and yet they were imperfect as well. Nevertheless, we need them. Verse 37, Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, Are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so you will not fall into temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You see, even the most trusted friends who walk with us are failable and sinful. Expect them to fail just like you do. God commands us to walk with others who will inevitably fail to some degree. This is to keep us ultimately dependent upon God, not man. While recognizing that God loves to work through broken people. You know, I've placed people in my life, I know some of you have talked to me about situations like this, where you've trusted people. 
You've asked them to be part of your inner circle here, and you've confessed to them. You've told them things. You've explained your struggles, and they did not reciprocate back. They did not give you the support that you had hoped for. Let me tell you something. An expectation is a resentment waiting to happen. When we place false expectations on people around us and their ability to comfort us, when we put demands on people and we expect them to fulfill in us what we need at that moment and they fail to do, it's so easy to grow resentment, isn't it? I can't believe she said that. I can't believe he didn't show up when I needed him most. He said he was going to pray and then he forgot. I asked him to keep watch and he fell asleep. While God commands us to work with the people, to ask the people around us, ultimately it is God that we rely upon, but we enlist. Now, that doesn't mean that we just pick anybody around us and say, well, you're probably going to fail, but why don't you come along with me and I'm going to tell you everything that's going on in my heart. There's some things that we can do on our side to pick the trusted allies that that sort of set our chances up the best and who we should bring with us. And there's some hallmarks of good allies. The first is a good ally shares your worldview. Let me say this a little differently. If you're a believer, you need believers who are your allies. I'll tell you why. There are many times that you might share with somebody who's an unbeliever and say, this is what's happening, and they're never going to say, ah, but eternity is forever and Christ is in control. They're going to say, try a little harder. It's okay. Love yourself more. Keep going forward. How can I help you? Whatever. The truth that we need to hear, the truth that washes us clean from what we pick up sort of on the journey of life is the word. And that word is modulated through the people around us who are believers. This does not mean we cannot get true wisdom from people who don't know the Lord. What this means is, is that everything that's said to us needs to be run through the worldview of the scripture, needs to be run through what God's word says. And finding people in our world to be allies who are already halfway there makes it a lot easier. A lot easier. So people around you who are believers. Secondly, allies keep watch. Not only do they keep watch on you and hold you accountable and help you walk through life, but they keep watch for the enemy. They stand guard. I have people, just yesterday, last night, somebody came up to me and had a conversation and they say, you know what, I see you doing this in your ministry and I'm concerned because of this. It was awesome. It was awesome. It was somebody who was watching, considering, praying for me, and watching out for ways that Satan might tempt me or might tempt them and to allow us to draw our eyes from Jesus. Trusted allies watch their own hearts. We want people around us who, if we're going to be honest with and we're going to share what's really going on, we want them to share what's really going on with them and to be real about what's happening here. And trusted allies watch for God. So we have worldview, they keep watch, and finally trusted allies pray. I know people are wrestling in prayer for me, and I know that I am wrestling in prayer for you. Trusted allies do that, and they keep their word according to it. In fact, James 5.16 says that. Listen, it says, Therefore confess your sins to one another, pray for one another that you may be healed. Listen to this. For the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. You're struggling with something and you want someone to pray for you? Don't just ask Joe Schmo. It says the prayer of a righteous man. You come here and you find those few people, you know who I'm talking about, who that after they pray for you, you feel like you've just done three weeks of church worship in a row. I've had people like that pray for me before the service and then I get up and I feel like, I'm almost, like I have nothing else to give because they just did everything that I needed right there in that prayer. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful. Three, admit your thoughts and feelings. This is the A in the word peace. Admit your thoughts and your feelings. Listen to Jesus. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Could you imagine how this statement must have shaken the disciples? They're walking with their leader, their rabbi, the Messiah. They've, con- they've confessed that he's the Messiah. They know that he's going to restore Israel, that Rome has no chance, that the kingdoms of this world are subject to him. Other times, when they were fearful, Jesus was asleep in the boat because he was in control. When the storms raged and the waves threatened to overtake them, Jesus got up calmly 
and rebuked it to stillness. He had always been in control. And here to his trusted servants in the quiet of the garden, he admits he's deeply distressed and sorrowful. I think if I were Peter, James, or John, what would I think? I feel like the wheels are coming off, and if I can't trust this, if he's shaken, how must I be as well? Jesus shared with his inner circle. He made prayer requests. He said, sit here, pray, watch. He told them what was going on. You see, people need to know what's happening in here. When we're suffering, people need to know exactly how they can be praying for us. Sure, we throw up those generic prayers or we'll say, Lord, you know what they need, just whatever they need. But there's nothing like a prayer that's very specific. And we can have those opportunities as long as we share with others who are going to be walking with us. He made prayer requests. You know, and not only that, in the admission of his thoughts and feelings, he didn't want to be alone in his suffering. Even though he would feel the physical pain of death at that time, in the end, he wanted to walk with his people. He didn't want to be alone. When we're suffering, just being with somebody often has tremendous power. You know, we don't want to confess what we need sometimes because admitting our needs to others is difficult. I mean, we either feel weak or foolish. Can't believe I'm asking this. Or we're taught that seeking help is wrong. This is for many of you older people, you know, sort of, I I won't say depression, we'll say next generation, but the Depression still had powerful effects on America as a whole and a lot of the older generations. There's a sense that I can do this, that I need to do this, just buck up, quit complaining, do what it is that you need to do, don't ask for help. But in the end, this is contrary to what God's will is for our life. God wants us to be sharing these things. God needs us. God, God desires that we would be sharing with one another, mutually supporting one another. It's not wrong to share your need. I said I've told this before, but someone came up to me one time in church and told me something that was very powerful, a confession for them, something very significant to them. To me, I thought that's it. You know, if someone comes up and says, Pastor, I need to confess something, my world, my context from where I come from is you're about to share something good. Like, it's like, like you bet this is going to be, it was not like that. And I thought that's it, but I could see the pain that it was causing the person. And they said, oh, I've carried that for 40 years. Wow. That, that little thing got carried for 40 years and who knows how it impacted. Some of you are carrying burdens you do not need to carry. Some of you have secrets that you need to share for any other reason than to get it out. To get it out. Or we think we must be strong for those around us. I'm the leader, I'm the husband, I'm the wife. I'm, I need to be strong because no one else will be. I need to hold everybody together. But Paul knew about weaknesses. New Testament, we see this. Paul, you know, he says that he had been given visions of heaven, that he'd seen the risen Christ, and in order to keep him from getting puffed up, because of the knowledge of what he had seen, it says that God sent him a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what that is. I think we don't know it, because that way when we read the Scripture, everyone puts their own thing in there. And they say, oh, it's probably this. And he begs Jesus three times, Lord, take this away from me. But this is what Jesus answered amid Paul's suffering. He says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power, that's Jesus, is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. If we read that list, that's suffering. Like Paul, Jesus relied on God's grace in dealing with hardship and suffering. In the Gospel of Luke, it's the same passage, so in the the Gethsemane passage, in Luke, it says that an angel appeared to Jesus. As he's, you know, we've all heard of, we've read about Jesus sweating droplets of blood in this prayer in Gethsemane. In that moment, as he's praying and he's agonizing, it says an angel of the Lord appeared to him and strengthened him. This is Christ. An angel of the Lord appears and strengthens him. 
So like Jesus, we must, this is C, count on God for comfort amid your suffering. Count on God. Do not look to the things of this world apart from God for comfort. They are false saviors. They are temporary. That's what I did. I was a drug addict. I didn't like life. Life wasn't palatable to me. I wish everything were different. Let's check out. Mine's obvious. I mean, we're almost like the foil for checking out. It's like we are checking out drug addicts. But we all have these things. In what ways do you check out? In what ways do you find safety and comfort in something in this world? Because in the end, they're temporary. Did you ever check out and then come back and realize that your problems are worse? (laughs) I've got some relief. I went shopping. Then I come back and my husband's still my husband. I don't know why going shopping didn't change my husband. I say that... Let's say, okay, maybe you dudes, you go shopping and then come back, my wife's still my wife, so we can make it like that too. Because it's not just the ladies who are shopping, trust me. I have an espresso machine at home, I know the struggle. <laughs> Way too much money. Not only are they temporary, they're distractions. We have a million ways, a million ways of distracting ourselves from the reality of our plight. We'll invent ways to be distracted. But in the end, they cannot bring blessing. They can bring pleasure. They can bring temporary relief. But they cannot bring the blessing that we really seek. Often the blessing that we really seek is through the suffering that we're going through. It's on the other side or it's in the journey. That's the blessing that we want. It's important for us to know that we must count on God for comfort and grace by faith. Why? Because sometimes in this world, what God tells us to do seems like it has... Zero impact on the situation that we're going through. Zero. You know, sort of like the, for me at least, like the very obvious solution to this is relationships. Someone's single. They want a partner. And people, often those who are married, say, look to God for your comfort. Look to God for your relationship. Well, God can't hug me. God can't kiss me and tell me I'm beautiful and tell me that he's proud of me like you can, like a person face to face. How's that going to fulfill me? In the end, the same idea is present in lots of ways when we look to God. It's by faith. I don't know how that's going to happen. Are you singles? I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't pretend to say that or I know that. I just know that God says when we look to him for comfort, he comforts us. When we look to him for our solace, he gives us solace. But this has to be embraced by faith. Because it's not always apparent how God can do this. Comfort does not mean the absence of pain either. It doesn't mean if you're single that you're going to not be painful. It's not going to be painful to be single. If you're sick, that it's not going to be painful in your sickness. If you're lonely, that it's not going to mean stop hurting. But it means that in the end, Christ will be with us and Christ will strengthen us because he's promised to do so is we accept that by faith. I'm always amazed at people who, many of you, who are in very often dire circumstances. One of your loved ones is dying. You're in a physical pain or some sort of illness. There's a job situation that doesn't seem to be resolving itself and it's impacting deeply financially in a deep way. And how some of you can just say, but I'm trusting God through it. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's painful, but God is good. But God is good. I mean, in the end, that's what I'm preaching, right? Isn't this what we should be doing? But I'm nevertheless amazed every time I see it displayed out before me in real life. There have been situations in this church where um, men's wives have been fading. And for years, They faithfully showed up to church, wheeling their wives in. Faithfully served their wives as they laid in bed. And I look at that as a husband and I say, that's what it means to be a husband. No matter what. No matter how hard it is. No matter the struggle. This is what I do. This is my responsibility under God. And how do you do do that? 
I trust God. They say, God gives me the strength. God gives me the strength. Because we know if we did it in our own power, you know your weakness. We wouldn't do it. We couldn't do it. They look to God for their comfort amid their suffering. Luke says, in this passage, this parallel passage, that the disciples were sleeping for sorrow. That they were so distraught, maybe by what had happened and Jesus is talking at the upper room that he was one was going to betray him. Maybe part of it was full bellies. But it says they were sleeping for sorrow. They had checked out of their suffering because they were weak, because they did not listen to Jesus. But Jesus came to accept his lot while they sought to escape it. So that's our fifth, the E, embrace your suffering. Embrace your suffering. 35 says, going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he says, everything is possible for you. Jesus is not denying that it's possible. Everything is possible for God. He says, take this cup from me. Ben, this this is the moment. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Man on death row, innocent, impending execution, gets to the point, says, you know I'm innocent, please save me. The answer comes, no, then I will go willingly. Could you imagine what our lives would look like if this was the goal we were seeking to achieve in the way we dealt with our suffering? how we would find joy amid it, how we'd be non, unstoppable despite our situation, how much more like Jesus we would be. When we embrace our suffering, we come to accept our situation as God's will. Accept our situation as God's will. Sometimes God's will is that we bear the consequences of someone else's actions. Someone's behaving sinfully towards me. Someone has done me wrong and now I carry the, the scars or even the traumas, the active wounds of their, believe, of their treating me this way. When we come to a place of acceptance, it doesn't mean that we say what is about to happen is good or what has happened to me is good. We accept the fact that if it has happened in time, then in some mysterious way, it is part of God's will. No one could say that it was good that Jesus was executed as an innocent man. Yet it was the Father's will that that would happen. Acceptance does not mean the embrace of suffering and acceptance does not mean that we don't seek to find solutions to life's problems. God has given us ways that we deal with life on life's terms in the scripture. But like I said, it means that we accept it as part of God's permissive will for our lives. Now even Jesus, as we see here in the garden, he starts with, Lord, take this. My soul is troubled to the point of even death. And he gets to the place where he can say, but not my will, your will. There's a process that happens. I think this process probably started on maybe even the day he was baptized. Maybe even the day he was born. I don't know. After all, he was born to die. He knew that that would happen. But it was a process. I mean, even Jesus prayed several times that there might be another way. It can take us years sometimes to come to a place of acceptance where the the traumas that we've had, the wounds that we've had, or the situation that we're in that has no promise of changing. We come to a place we say, okay, all right. See, the thing about the human will is that we'll pick something up and try to control it. And we'll say, this is what I want. And we'll manipulate the world around us in order to get what we want until God breaks through and finally says, we come to a place, okay, your will, not mine. Then we'll put that thing down. And then we'll walk away and we'll go, <laughs> we'll go grab it again and we'll hold it and we'll start doing it all over again. The idea to be able to set our own will down to pick up Christ's will for our lives is something that has to happen again and again and again. And that's okay. Spiritual growth is the process of lengthening the time between picking up our worries and demanding our way and putting them down and then returning to pick them up again. Spiritual growth occurs when we can make the decision and come to a place where we can put it down and leave it down. Jesus' embrace of suffering, the cup that could not pass him, 
made him prepared to face even the cross. He said, fine, fine. And listen to how his resolve changes. So we hear him praying, Lord, take this cup away. He says, my soul is troubled to the point of death. Finally, he says, not my will, but your will, Father. And he comes back, the disciples are sleeping again, says they don't know what to say. They don't know what to, and this is what Jesus says. Returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. Now, we know the events were dictated in such a way that Jesus really had no choice at this point. I mean, the betrayer's there. They're coming to arrest him. But in some way, his attitude, you can read it. You can hear it when he says it. All right, enough is enough. Now's the time. Let's do this. We hear this change in Jesus' resolve. Now, how do we get this? Because that's really the question. How do we get to this point where our suffering has its power, where we come to a place of acceptance, and we finally make that change? First, we focus on God's character amid our suffering. God's good. God's merciful. God's just. Nothing happens to us apart from God's permissive will, and because God is good and he loves us, he will not give us anything that is not for our good in the end. That's a hard pill to swallow. Nevertheless, it's true. We focus on God's will and not our own. Remember, we were made for him, not the other way around. We are God's. We've been purchased. So in the end, when there's a a connection or or a dispute between what I want and what God wants, guess what? It's better to just say what you want soon. Sooner the better. This change takes wisdom. Because we need to understand those things that we need to work to change, reality, how we move the things around us, and what is completely out of our control. We need to know the difference. And finally, we need to focus on the ultimate outcome of our suffering. Suffering is not for nothing, guys. Our suffering is not meaningless. Our suffering has a purpose. In Hebrews 12, it says, For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. That means that when Jesus was going to the cross, maybe even this right here, maybe in the garden when he said, okay, not, your, not my will, but your will, let's go, it's time to go. It says he had joy set before him. You're his joy. He knew that you and all of your brothers and sisters who would come to be saved would be saved because of what he was doing, the suffering that he would feel. Looking to the end is a motivation for the pain. This is a lesson that I learned uh, in the Marines. Um, I hate running. I hate, I hate running. I don't need to tell him. Well, and I joined the Navy because I thought, how far do they run? The ships can't be that big, you know? It's like... <laughs> so I joined the Navy, and they send me to 2nd Marine Division in Camp Lejeune. So now I'm basically a Marine. I'm wearing a Marine Corps uniform, and I'm doing everything a Marine does. And guess what Marines do? They run. And I learned, as much as I hated it, the more I thought about how much I hated it, the harder it was. So I had to learn to do this thing in my heart, in my head, that was like, okay, it's five in the morning. Haven't eaten breakfast. I stayed up too late last night. It's time to run five miles. This is going to hurt. And I can't wait for this to hurt. And you start running. You feel the pain, the stitch in your side. You want to give up. And I would just keep telling myself, oh, doesn't this feel good? That's why Marines are crazy. That's why me and my brothers are crazy. Because we will turn something that is painful to any other person into something that's wonderful in our eyes. Isn't this awesome? It hurts so bad. Yeah, man, this is terrible. (laughs) We can do that in our Christian life as well when we're suffering. Because we know our suffering is not pointless. Our suffering has meaning and purpose in it. And when we embrace it, it's easier for us to get through it. To get through it. Someone in my life has recently made that turn, I think, in their singlehood, and they have, there's, you can just see a difference in the attitude. They're embracing it, and they're saying, it is what it is. I'm going to move forward anyway. I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going to, and they're embracing it. They're never saying it's, e- it's easy, but they're saying it is what it is. There's a lot of power in that phrase, it is what it is, acceptance. Like I said, the truth is, is that, and we often fail to see, is that the peace we so badly desire is through our suffering, not around it. I mean, we all know suffering. Some of us know it better than others. 
Others have not yet tasted the bitter gall of suffering. I see some of these kids here, young people, not really had that tragedy yet. This is not a threat. This is a promise, and this is out of love. It's going to happen. It's part of life. It's not how do we avoid it, it's how do we deal with it when it happens. How do we become more like Christ in the process? But we are not without hope. We know that Christ has shown us a way to embrace the Father's will for us through suffering and has given us a hope for tomorrow. That day when everything will be made right and suffering will be no more. All that will be left on that day is God's glory in the image of Christ that we will bear in our heavenly bodies. When we look like Christ, when we stand before the throne faultless and blameless because of what he's done and because of the suffering we endured while we were here. But while we suffer here awaiting that day, let's find the peace, pray to the Father, enlist the fellowship of trusted friends, admit your thoughts and feelings, count on God for your comfort, And finally, embrace your suffering. I'll leave you with this. Uh, A man named Reinhold Niebuhr. Reinhold Niebuhr is a theologian. He actually taught, actually went to school at Elmhurst College. He graduated in 1910. He was a Reformed theologian. Many of you have probably never heard that name before. Now, when you drive by, you see like Niebuhr Hall or whatever, and they don't make sense. You'll understand. So now you know the person. This is this guy. This was the coolest picture. All the rest were too stoic. This is, he's a nice guy, right, Reinhold? So he uh, was a theologian and a scholar, and he wrote uh, some devotional things, and he wrote a prayer. Many of you have heard the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. You see it knitted and cross-stitched on things. Some of us know it well from other venues and that, but that's not the prayer. Certainly not the first prayer, and it's not the whole prayer either. So I want to read the original serenity prayer to you. So when you hear people saying it or talking about it, you can say in your mind and quietly, you know, that's not the original. This is the original because the original has a lot of stuff we need to hear. I want you to listen to these words. Read them up here. God, give us grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed. Courage to change the things which should be changed. And the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. So far, we're tracking. But this is the part that's really important. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking, as Jesus did, the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Some of us are trying to be more than reasonably happy in this life. Because of sin, maybe the best we can hope for is reasonably happy. So on that day, we can be supremely happy with him. Let this be our prayer and a picture of each of our lives as we look to God for peace when our cup cannot pass. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this message. We we see Christ here, Lord, just um, on death row, knowing he's innocent. We see how he embraces his suffering and how he processes through that, Lord, for our good. Lord, you know the areas of our life that we are all suffering in, and we pray, Lord, that you would just uh, give us the grace that we need to endure it. Help us, Lord, to call out to you in prayer, to move people around us, to embrace the suffering that we have because we know our suffering is not for nothing. That we will become more like Christ. And in that day when we are supremely happy, we will look back and we'll say, I see, I understand. I know what you are doing. Let this be our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Adam here. Well, I want to thank you for tuning in to Grace Bible Church, and I would love to hear what you thought of today's program or of ways that we can be praying for you and with you. So check us out on social media at GBCL. Also, if you would like to support our ministry, you can give securely at our website at www.gbclm.org. Now remember, God loves you, and so do we.